engagement with the Salesforce and other technology communities, position of our product, and just thinking outside the box. So instead of looking inside all the things that you know we want to do and enhance the product on the micro detail, thinking more at a macro level, how we work, how we fit into DevOps pipelines, that kind of thing. That is Richard Clark. They're describing his role as Chief Innovation Officer for Provar Testing. I'm Josh Burke, your host for the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Richard about the topic he brought to the Cactus Force Virtual Conference, that being integrating Slack and Salesforce together. But we start as often with his early years. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I um, started in that home computing era in the 80s as a teenager. Mm, uh, you mm. know, when you used to, uh, you're probably a bit young for this, you used to have to write games by uh, typing them in from magazines. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to do that. In fact, I used to publish them as well. I used to actually yep. uh, type up on a typewriter because we didn't have a printer. The games oh. I'd written and send them into magazines and then help <gasps> with all the bug fixes. <laughs> no way. Yeah, that's, that's how it worked. So first of all, I want to thank you for thinking that I'm that young, uh, because I remember, Blake, I almost I almost had a I never want to do pr computer programming again moment because I got so frustrated with with the syntax errors I was putting in because mm. I was typing them directly from the magazine. But I love the fact that you are so old school. You're actually the person who is typing those up for, for the magazines to publish. OK, first of all, first computer, what was it? Uh, Acorn Atom, followed nice. quickly by a TI-994A. Nice, nice. TI-99, I think, was one of the first personal computers I ever played a game on. It was this thing where you, what was it called? Vector or something like that. You, you're flying a ship in a cavern until you hit too many things. And mm. then and then Parsec, I think it was called Parsec. Oh, Parsec. Oh, my yeah. word. I used to uh, be on the leaderboard for, you know, when you just have to use uh -huh. an old-fashioned camera to take pictures that you'd clocked Parsec. Yeah, my word. Right, right. <laughs> nice. Very cool. So, okay, you've always been in the computer. How did you get into the Salesforce ecosystem? So that was an interesting one. I'd actually been in IT quite a number of years, and I hadn't realized at the time I'd been developing CRM applications because we weren't calling them then. We were calling mm. them order management apps and we were calling them mm. customer databases. And I was sick and tired of doing login pages and registration <laughs> apps and things like that. And uh, I guess we'd come across master data management, but it wasn't called that then either. But mm -hmm. I um, I was fortunate to join a company back in 2007 who wanted to be the next Salesforce. And they're actually a Salesforce yeah. Platinum partner now. And oh, that was where we sort of ended up, sort of one of our customers wanted to implement Salesforce. So, okay, Okay, we'll do this. And um, I don't think Apex had just come out. Yeah, Apex had just oh, come wow. out and I did a presentation about it, not okay. realizing no one else had written a line of Apex yet. So <laughs> I got lucky with that one. And it's just been a sort of a, a more of an upwards roller coaster ever since. Okay, so today we're talking about your Cactus Force presentation that was Salesforce integrating in various ways back to Slack. But let's start on that touch point. Why Slack as the integration point? Okay, so really that started as a request from our uh, CEO, Garant. Mm. He had said to me that he wanted to share all the wins, all the new business we'd won with the whole company. And not, we only had, I think at that time, we only had uh, 30 people on Salesforce. Now we've got more like 60. Mm -hmm. And so the other sort of, 50% of the company were not on Salesforce, but we they were using Slack. And he wanted to make announcements. And I, I think I started off showing him, or I implemented the apps from the App Exchange and from the Slack App Store. Gotcha. And he's like, yeah, but no, I want to say this. I was like, but it doesn't do that. And I was like, well, that's going to that's gonna be a few weeks' work. And I, I went away, Googled it, found uh -huh. an article by Christoph Conrates, and thought, let me try this and put it in the org that afternoon. Then he asked for more changes, of course. That's the way Of it course, works. because that's the way it works. <laughs> so when you say make announcements, like why was that so attractive? What kind of problems were you trying to solve by being able to kind of broadcast things in a channel like Slack? Yeah, I think it's part of the sort of growth of a business where from having, I think when I joined Provar, we had maybe 50 customers. Um, we sort of tripled that in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. So in terms of our accounts team and our customer service team and our consulting teams and our developers didn't actually know who our customers were anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so these names would crop up and people mm. wouldn't know if they're a new customer or not. But okay. by putting that announcement out, one, we were able to communicate an indication of the deal size, how big mm -hmm. a customer is this. It also gave people a feel good 
over the brands that were there, the company brands that we were dealing with. Just uh, excuse me a second. I need to let the cat out of the room. <laughs> there we go. First world problems of working from home. Um, exactly. Exactly. First of all, I have to ask, what's the name of your cat? Uh, that one's Mally. Mally. Okay. Um, Fifty percent chance that you're going to hear the same for me. My feral cat Shadow has started making a habit of coming in and yelling at me, and then running out of the room. We'll see what happens. You were talking about your broader audience not knowing about new accounts and clients coming into your ecosystem. I think. Yeah. So um, by building that awareness, it made everyone feel good. They knew they could see what was happening without us having to do a, a boring monthly, here's a company revenue chart. They were able to see things were happening. Mm. And we sort of extended that out to say, well, this customer's renewed and this customer's an expansion. So we just sort of expanded that to sort of share the knowledge about those customers. But I think the biggest gain was that where our staff knew a customer was new, they probably had more patience and were more focused on being more reactive, more responsive to those customers, knowing that they were new customers. So that actually there were things they didn't know and maybe they hadn't seen some help documentation. So it really helped build mm. awareness, I think. So it sounds like you're kind of building a dial ton of information that was kind of stored in Salesforce that they would not normally like. They, it almost sounds like they would have to be logging to Salesforce constantly in order to be aware of this information. Exactly. And I actually implemented it as a um, chat automation at first, but that was the problem. Mm. Like only the people that were really on Salesforce knew about it. And right. the wider team just didn't know who these customers were or what the deal size was. Got it. Okay. So you're talking about solutions that work with Slack and Salesforce across a spectrum. We're going to talk no code, low code, pro code this being a developer podcast i definitely want to get in the weeds about like you know how you're forming the apex and what are the advantages there and stuff like that but let's let's go ahead and start on the low end of the spectrum and you just mentioned it there you're installed there's an app exchange plugin that works with slack what exactly does that package do so it's actually been enhanced recently it gives you an option to set up a number of uh, events um okay. almost like if you think about how push topics are to messaging yes you can say here's a predetermined event and this information will be sent on this uh, predefined channel when this event happens so there's a number of configurations you can do with that but you can't really customize the format of the output i'm not mm. even sure if it how it respects field level security and things like that so mm. it, it does quite a lot of things now um, and mm -hmm. you can actually extend it with code as well. But I like, if I start writing oh. code, I prefer to sort of own the whole thing and the understand whole the whole. Yeah, exactly. Rather than sort of build on top of something where I don't really know what's happening under the covers. I don't know how it's sharing record access. I don't know how it's looking at field level security. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because this is a managed package, so you can't like see exactly, exactly. the lines of code that's being run there. Got it. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Okay. So that kind of answers my next question. But is there was there any other inflection point where you're like, I want to throw flow at this, or I want to throw Apex at this? Yeah. So that was. Um, I'm a big fan of invocable Apex, mm -hmm. and I sort of try and always write something so that. I'm not dictating the business logic when something will happen. I'm just enabling it. So mm. I think even with that opportunity publisher, the first thing I did was do it with Invocable Apex. Got and it. so I exposed that to our uh, admins to use, and they could say, use that same Apex code for the opportunity. But actually, mm -hmm. because they were writing the message, they could change what it said. Uh, what the details were, what fields they wanted to include, and they Got were able it. to use it on case, and they were able to use it on uh, our trial record custom object as well. So they were able to reuse that. So I quite liked that. I'm a lazy coder. I'd rather <laughs> write extra code if I don't need to. No, I, I love it. And that's that's kind of, that, I find that interesting because it almost sounds like the plugin almost serves as a prototype, like a test thing. But it doesn't seem like the amount of effort to put into your implementation that you're showing a cactus force is so much more code and work it almost you know what I, i'm like having ownership over that code feels like it's more useful than just having a plugin that you don't have to worry about yeah i found the plugin was really useful for convincing the stakeholder so showing our mm. ceo look this is what you can have this works mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's free it's like mm, that's quite nice but as soon as you have that can we just conversation invariably it can become more difficult to adapt to, to those plugins and use someone else's mm -hmm. code yeah. than actually understanding. And I actually gained a lot personally from doing it. Mm. I, I'd never used the Cubal interface before. Um, mm. 
I didn't realize some of the sort of reverse stuff I've done since. I'd never realized what I was doing was Apex REST services. I just thought, well, that's fine. That makes sense. <laughs> These annotations. Oh, it must have always been that way. I didn't right. realize that was new. It was just the, <laughs> oh, that works. <laughs> nice. Okay. So, I, and I want to get into some more of those details, but let's start backwards and go into more details on how Slack itself is set up for this. So, like, kind of define a webhook for me and what kind of functionality are they exposing in Slack? Okay. Slack's interesting that it, it, it has a lot of parallels. It resonates with me the same way Salesforce does that. Mm. If I want to extend it, I create an app and I create that app within my own workspace and I can do that. I can sign up for my own workspace for free and I can build in there. And in those apps, there's various things you can do. Um, you can even create your own bots. So conversational apps, if you like, mm. you can have buttons. Um, you can give the app permissions to read from certain channels, to post messages, reply on threads. So it really feels like Salesforce in many ways that it's mm -hmm. really easy to sort of build something uh, and declaratively as well. And when you add an app, uh, you can add a webhook and that webhook can uh, then be given, assigned to a particular channel and then just get a GUID for that or you can use uh, OAuth to integrate it. The other thing mm. you can do is there's a concept of workflow in Slack as well. That's a paid feature, so you can't use it on the, the free uh, tier. Okay. The workflow is nice because if you think about an org in Salesforce, the admin for that isn't normally going to be the same admin as for your Slack, probably completely different teams. Many right. people talk to each other. Right. So with workflows, your Slack admin can control what the message is that's put out and what access it has all within okay. their domain. And they can mm. expose attributes or parameters that you want to include, and they can do the formatting of the message. And that was the sort of the low code solution I did with Flow was mm. around using a workflow instead, but both use webhooks at the end of the day. So am I getting it right that the workflow can kind of set up like a, almost like a Mad Lib structure, and then you're just putting in the nouns and the verbs that the message would go out to the channel? Exactly. Or in okay. the formatting and the markup. Whereas if you do the sort of free webhook version, there's something called the block kit. Mm -hmm. And the block kit is the sort of JSON schema for formatting messages in Slack. And it's really powerful. I mean, you can do some fantastic, you know, graphics and buttons and uh, modal entries and all sorts of things with it, but it is extra work. Whereas if that's done within the workflow in Slack, it's kind of, a, again, it's a sort of that low code option to doing it uh, yeah. instead of having to sort of maintain that outside the Slack application in something like Salesforce. Interesting. I Okay, so even in prepping for this, I was not aware... When I, when I was looking and seeing formatting and things like that, the concept of being able to even provide a modal window. So then you can have client interactions based on the webhook messages. You can, yes, absolutely. And okay. all simple buttons or, okay. you know, if you want to do a poll application, things like that, you could bake the, the answers or the questions in or out of Salesforce if you wanted to. Interesting. Okay. I want to touch back on what you said briefly there. So when you set up the webhook, you get a GUID, which in and of its own right is kind of security through obscurity. And you mentioned you mentioned OAuth, but do you have any tips or suggestions for making that webhook secure? Uh, I mean, it's just following the documentation. One of the challenges I had was I didn't understand if I can have it as a connected app, what mm. is the... I'm a system admin on our org. I didn't want to connect it as me. Um, so I wanted to make oh. sure that I was only giving away the permissions <laughs> and the visibility of data right, that I wanted. Right. So okay. it's definitely one to look at and one where I didn't have a problem because I was pushing mainly from Salesforce the content I wanted to push on very public mm, events. Okay. Um, but if I was writing a Slack app to query back into Salesforce, I'd be a lot more careful. Got um, it. On the but the other way around, from Salesforce to Slack, I mean, you could, you're could only exposing from Slack saying, right, these are the public channels or channel that this app can talk to, and that webhook can only publish there that information. Got it. Okay. So on the Slack side, and how is the web, like when you send a message to the webhook, who is, is it like a bot user that's being set up, like an app user that's being set up in Slack, and that's who says, this is my message to everybody? Yeah, so the app has a, it says it's posted by the app itself. Uh, so the app and a little logo or icon that you want to associate to that mm. is sort of broadcasting that rather than it saying from 
Slack admin or anything like that. It's the app name itself. And gotcha. I called the app, I think the first one I called it was Opportunity Publisher. Mm-hmm. And of course, when the admins then used it for cases, I was like, okay, I'm going <laughs> to rename that app because it's not that anymore. So yeah, you do need to think right. carefully about what that thing is, or you just create another app. Um, oh. And you can even share those. You can publish those just like App Exchange apps. You can publish them on the oh, Slack, okay. uh, show them to other customers if you wanted to. Got it. Oh, refactoring Dynamo Scope Creep. I, I hear you. I hear you. Mm, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then going back over to the Salesforce side, if we start going to from the kind of no code, which is the plugin, to the low code, which is completely sans Apex, I kind of feel like we're about to go through like a penny tour of nouns, which have kind of come up on the pod a few times. So let's start with probably the the main one, which which is external services. So what are external ser- services on the platform and how are they helping you get this job done? Okay. So I talked just now about the workflow in Slack. Mm-hmm. The workflow in Slack has a particular format or schema. So you need to be able to generate an open API schema for that. Mm-hmm. I was fortunate that someone else had already done that hard work using Swagger and I took what they did and (laughs) boy, oh boy, did I have problems when I wanted to adapt it thinking I'll just add this in. It's like, well, why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it accept? Oh, really? And I listened to your talk with Tony a couple of weeks ago (laughs) um, about ways of opening API 3 and I thought, aha, that's Uh what I need. (laughs) (laughs) Open API 2 doesn't work. So external services is a great way to call those functions without code, without writing those HTTP requests for compatible interfaces. And that word compatible was quite key. And it was only because someone else had done the heavy lifting that I found that here's a uh, schema uh, for -hmm. that message, for that open API interface that I could use. Mm -hmm. And then the plumbing of... I've got to say, I know we say flow is low code, but there are elements, if it wasn't in a video, I'd struggle with uh, sometimes. <laughs> so, Well, and, and again, we've had that theme on the show several times. It's like, and I feel like a lot of developers in the community do kind of push against the low code branding because and they, they kind of replace it. And, I'm, and I love that you just said that video set you, set you right because they're like, it's kind of like visual coding. You have something that's like functions. You have something that's like variables. You're just not really calling them that. And if you don't go through the right visual steps, then you know your your hands are a little tight behind your back. But it, it but it has a programmatic feel to that. Would you kind of agree with that? I would. At the same time, though, as a programmer, your mind is objecting mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. okay now i declare a variable mm-hmm. now i give it a value and now yep. i assign it to this other thing and you're like but i can do that in one line <laughs> <laughs> and you sort of don't want to have three steps to do something yes. like that and that yes. can be the uh, that can be the challenge yes you have you have just encapsulated my mental challenge with with becoming a flow expert and it is as primordial as muscle memory i swear because it's like i know what you're trying to do and i want to i want to type the word far <laughs> you won't let my fingers type the word far and i've i have completely been there my next but question course, will, if you want to debug it then yes. it's actually you really appreciate how it's broken down when it comes to debugging what goes wrong which i feel like is a huge evolution of flow that that was one of the things that I, that frustrated me so much about it in its early days and i have heard and seen over and over again that it's gotten a lot more mature in its in its more re- recent releases absolutely and i was going to have a follow up qu- question about the role of swagger and open api but i think i will have to ping tony <laughs> and, <laughs> and tell him that the role of open api was pointing in the right direction i think that's wonderful were there was there stuff that you had to do in flow before you could just kind of build out that step to say send this message no i mean once you've created that external service within the flow and you create an action and one of the i'm trying to remember one of the options on action you had to go custom and pick was it apex managed or something it's effectively i'm guessing create an apex class view in the background the same name as that external service mm, mm-hmm. that's what i'm assuming it does Gotcha. There's just right. some magic that appears. And then because you've then picked that service, it then knows what the attributes are of that service. So then you can use a dot notation to access and assign your, mm-hmm. maybe it's an input variable, or maybe it's a field that you've read with a, a read on the object, depending if it's a, obviously how it's initiated that flow. And then you do your assignment step. Got it. Okay. So the external services are setting up the HTTP slash REST handshakes. The schema 
is describing the dictionary that can be used to talk to that external service. And then within Flow, there's basically a push button way for some magical apex to be written in the background that you say, here are the inputs I want to put in that schema. Go do all the hard work for me. Does that yeah. sound about right? And I'm okay. sure that, that's how it appears. I'm sure I could probably put my own code in there if I wanted as well. But it was kind of one of those sort of eureka moments where you think, "How I did that over here and by magic, I can now talk to it in Flow. Right. Um, it's a special moment. In any considerations within Flow, like does this work equally well in headless versus like a screen flow? Yes. Um, so I mainly, I, I use the screen flow to test it. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing is if I get it working with screen flow, I can do a lot more manual unit testing. Oh, than sure. If I'm trying to wire it up automatically and thinking, did it not fire? Was my conditions right? Or yeah. why didn't I get a message pop up? So I tend to do everything with a screen flow first. And once I know that's working and my external service works and my attributes are coming out as I expect, yeah. I can then create a, a, a auto launched one or a sort of triggered one. Um, obviously one of the key things is when when I did an Apex, I used Cubable because I wanted to have that ability to make sure it can scale and that things that can be chained if I want to, so the messages arrive in the right order. Now with okay. Flow, I didn't have that option. I couldn't say, make sure that this message is posted before this one. It's up to the platform how it fires mm. those events. Okay. And I still have to think about, actually, the, this Flow can be fired, I assume, on multiple updates at once. And you want okay. to think about, I probably don't want within uh, something like a Slack post, I don't want to fire 100 messages in one minute. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm ruining Slack if I do that. Um, mm. Because if people, everyone's phones in the office when we're back in the office start <laughs> going, ka-ching, 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 ka 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 uh, you'll probably uh, not be employed for much longer. <laughs> so you definitely want to think about that as when it's a uh, not a visual initiated flow. <laughs> First of all, two pro tips there, um, and I and it's it, like I'm now I'm remembering um, Daniel Huss uh, episode where he, where he's like, yeah, it was great when I alerted all of my engineers that they were breaking their limits until I was doing it every single minute, and it's like, <laughs> yep, good good tip. So actually, yeah, let me just follow up on that really quickly. So is there anything on the Slack admin side to throttle that, or is it really up to the implementer to be a good neighbor and not fall into that kind of behavior? Yeah, I, I think it's down to the implementer. And one okay. of the things you can do is use the threads in Slack. So with some extra permissions mm. you grant, some extra scopes that you add to your Slack app. Um, if I was doing it in with an Apex mind on, what I would do is iterate through all those records and maybe say there are 32 updates and then post them all in a thread. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and then I wouldn't necessarily get a notification for every single one of those. Obviously, within Slack config as well, whether a channel is muted or not, I know I can control it for myself. I haven't mm. checked if I can do it programmatically, but you'd probably want to think about those things and not having it uh, wake up your global sales team <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> yes. And how easy would it be just to like set up a test channel that you're the only user on? I guess that depends on uh, your very, admin very privileges. Very, very easy. That's, okay. that's what I always do. I mean, I use a nice. test workspace first. So the first thing I tend to do is you know, whenever I'm um, doing something like the Cactus Falls talk, I yeah. uh, try and use a free Slack workspace and work in there so I don't disturb anyone. Got um, it. And then if I need to pay for it, I mean, I, I upgraded for a one user, what was it, $10 a month or whatever it was. Mm. Um, so it was nothing in terms of uh, a little bit of investment of my time and effort to do that, to get extra features. But it's quite easy to do that. And then when I'm ready, yes, I'll put it in a channel that's just me in that channel. No one else can see it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not big on adding everyone in their dog to a channel. I let people <laughs> uh, join channels because they're public and if they're interested. Yeah. But we did actually put the opportunity announcements in our general channel because that was considered, you know, a company-wide communication. But I'm always saying to people, you've got to think about what that channel is for, what's its purpose. Mm -hmm. And don't bombard people. Same with email. You know, uh, right. you don't want to wake up to 10,000 Slack messages. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the Apex side of the implementation. I think you just touched on it a little bit there, but if, if you have more detail on like that, because it's, in my mind, thinking about the flow external services seems like a very straightforward visual code implementation, pretty quick and easy to do. But what were some of the things that you were just like, no, I really need Apex to solve this for me? So the main one was if I want to format that message, then the I would hate to be trying to construct a JSON payload in flow 
Mm, it's not okay. exactly we don't have the merge fields that you have in even process mm-hmm. builder for example at the moment or i can mm-hmm. work out how to do them so yeah. string concatenation in flow with lots of assignment functions is is not nice right. so if you want to format that message and use the block kit then you 100 percent have to use apex okay if you want to uh, as i say if you want to make decisions on how you present that so you mm-hmm. may say, actually, I've got three options here. I might want to put some buttons on and make it a poll, or I might want to uh, make this part of a thread. Uh, the other thing, of course, is I don't just have to post things to Slack. I can actually query things in Slack, and mm-hmm. I can't do that easily, as far as I can tell, within Flow. But mm-hmm. in Apex, it's much simpler to me to look at that and know, actually, I've got that scope. I can actually go and see, has anyone been talking about X or Y? Um, yeah. or if I want to go cross channels as well, it's easier to do that within Apex. And are you still utilizing like the webhook implementation for that, or are you falling back on like a Slack API? Uh, a mixture of both. So the okay. webhook API tends to be bound to an individual channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're working on a single channel, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you need to use the Slack API if you're doing you know more like than the that queries. If you're going in it. Exactly. Got it. Okay. All right. So talk to me about the queuable annotation and kind of because I'm old school, and so I kind of by going back to the muscle memory thing, I'm I'm still fondly remembering at future but how do those two compare and why would you use one versus the other yeah so i originally did at future and i think the first thing mm. i hit heard along was i'd created a inner class to define the structure of the message i wanted to pass mm-hmm. and of course you immediately go uh, can't do that and you think mm-hmm. oh, i'll use an s object uh, can't use that <laughs> so the fact you could only use uh, primitive types yes made my thought oh, this isn't a very uh, extensible mm-hmm. solution mm-hmm. and i've got to pre-format the message before i pass it in post so yep. I, I thought of when I've, i came across the cubal interface and christoph had mentioned it and then i saw the light that i can pass these complex <laughs> objects and i can pass this array and i can actually do stuff with it yeah um, that was the biggest one and then seeing actually the governor limits were better mm-hmm. the fact i could control the sequencing if i wanted to and have them chained so mm-hmm. that my messages come out in the right order i mean those were those were massive decisions as part of that yeah, I mean, at future is a good old friend, but it really is at the end of the day simply an annota- annotation that does a little stuff in the back end. Where Cubal's, Q- you know, it's more of um, I want to say framework, but that's not the right word. But it has a lot more tools in its toolkit. Absolutely, it's the it's the only way. I'd probably I don't know if I'd ever use an at future again now. Um, yeah. If I if I did a code review now and I saw an at future <sighs> and it had just been written, I'd be asking why why. Yeah, I, and I'm kind of patting at, if this was in video, patting at future on the head, but I completely agree with that statement. <laughs> so let's move to the other important one, invocable method. Anything people should know if they're setting up a class for that invocable method is for exposing to flow or process builder, correct? Yeah. So I guess the first one is, like, unfortunately, we can only have one invocable method per class which can gotcha. really constrain your thinking and redesign your uh, class model that you've carefully put together of what's going to be in there. Again, the ability to pass a complex object, you can do that. Uh, mm-hmm. In a class, again, is a great way to do that. And making sure that you correctly provide descriptions for the, any attributes that you have <laughs> so you can control what people, and they know what they're using. Otherwise, you end up with a, uh, if you're not careful, you end up with just an array that appears in, say, Process Builder, and you have to work mm. out what goes in position zero, what goes in position one. So mm. using those techniques um, is a, a great, it's some great documentation on doing that on Invocable Apex. Got it. Because this is kind of like that portion of, LWC, where you have to be very mindful of the configuration because the code isn't looking at this. It's actually a user interface that an admin's going to be looking at it, and you're, you're talking directly to a human. Exactly. Exactly. Someone's going to be at the end of that. And it's, I actually used to use Process Builder quite a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I was a late flow convert. <laughs> um, I'm still waiting for that button that I know you can view flow or process builders in flow, but I'm waiting for that button mm. that just converts it for converts me it for rather you. than me having to go through the effort. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that's something I think I just find it's easier <laughs> when you're doing very something very, very simple. Um, mm-hmm. It's just a nicer interface at times, um, gotcha. but it's not the future. That's for sure. Cool. Okay. So let's talk about like current state. Like for, you started with the plugin. You sounds like your production code is, is kind of now to the pro code side of things. First question is like how, after you've gotten these requests and it's kind of, you know, the scope creep has sort of flowed in. Like, how complicated would you describe your your current solution for handling this? 
Um, I think the, what we actually got in our production is still very simple, that we okay. have uh, flows that are, I say, controlled by admins of the things I want to post. I've got my Apex class, my Slack publisher class, which I recently put into a org dependent package. There we are. That's another subject. Uh-huh. Um, so I just found I wanted to maintain that outside of our outsourced Salesforce provider. I wanted okay. to still own that code. So I put it in an unlocked package so I could awesome. do that without worrying about scratch orgs. So that was the, oh, this is easy. So you've got <laughs> a test class, some data and uh, a named credential, I think, in there with the actual Apex class. So that was the easiest 101 package ever. Got um, it. <laughs> so it's, it's really easy for me to do that. But the uh-huh. flow side stays within the org. So it stays with the happy soup nice nice okay and so yeah i think i need to clarify because you're actually using you're not really using the plugin anymore but you're using the whole spectrum of things so that whoever has to have access to this to get their job done whether they're a coder or an admin they're just sort of coming at the entry level that they're comfortable with exactly i mean we try and limit the amount of code but yeah anyone else Mm -hmm. coding could again call the methods on there and make the same calls and uh, invoke the same actions etc so absolutely but most of it i say is done we try and have all our business processes in admin friendly flows or mm-hmm. process builder. And in Apex triggers, we try and limit it to things that must happen or are not business process related. Um, for example, when we have a, a new account that's made active, we immediately create an entitlement object. I think that might have come in spring mm. as a feature anyway. So we used okay. to do that. So that was in an Apex trigger because it must always happen. There's no business logic around it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So going back to the beginning, you had your problem statement. You wanted to be able to give a dial tone of Salesforce related information to your Slack users without them having to be, you know, aware in Salesforce. How, how is it going and how are your users reacting to it? I mean, it's brilliant. One of the things I hadn't appreciated was the use of the sort of different likes and icons. And I think it's really really good seeing people you know they've read it because people have put a like on it or they put a, a thumbs up or yeah. you know a celebration and it huh. really is being able to hover on that and seeing who has liked it and seeing that's across our whole company across yeah. all regions all demographics and the time today people are working is a bit worrying at the moment <laughs> so at 2 a.m there's far too many people liking a win um, but i think that's been good and the fact yeah. that they can have a conversation about it and someone say you know they can add a personal element to it and say, well done to individuals who helped that deal. God. The other thing we learned was my original version, we were saying who the opportunity owner was. And that yeah. was actually quite uh, divisive because obviously it wasn't one person who'd made the mm. deal happen. There'd been a, yep. a whole team of people, not just those in Salesforce. So we quickly changed that in recognition that it was a whole company effort to win a customer, mm. not just the salesperson that's got a signature on a DocuSign. And that's our show. Now, in the show notes, we will have links to Richard's original presentation. Be sure to go ahead and check that out. Now, before we go, I did ask after Richard's favorite non-technical hobby. It's one that's come uh, pretty common on the show. Uh, you might even call it turning into a key ingredient. Those of that follow me on Instagram, and I tend not to mix my uh, Twitter and Instagram uh, mm-hmm. community, uh, will know I'm a very keen and able, I would say, baker, whether that's breads, pies, pastries, cakes. So that's my sort of favorite way. And it's, it's a lot like nice. programming in a way. You've got a list of ingredients, yes. you've got a set of tools, you follow some instructions. But I've got to say, I'm probably a better baker than I am a coder <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> I want to thank Richard for the great conversation and information. And as always, I want to thank you for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this show, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks again, everybody. And I'll talk to you next week.